the screenwriter of the cult classic film, The Crow, David J. Scow. David, thanks for being on with us. Thanks for doing this. Oh man, I'm so let's excited. see where it takes. Let's see where it takes us. Exactly. Let's go on an adventure. All right. So uh, before you're we entering get- a dark room, <laughs> you're entering my life, which is a dark room. As you can see, it is a dark room. Literally. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it matches the tone perfectly. Yeah. Exactly. So before we really kind of roll into discussing the crow and adapting it from the comic book and everything, I want to get your origin story, just kind of where you came from, how you happened into screenwriting, how that led into your big moment, your big break, and then how that got you the crow. Well, um, uh, one thing that happens when you do interviews like this is people say, do you have advice for people who want to work in the motion picture industry or be in television or write screenplays or something like that? Okay. And I don't necessarily have a whole lot of advice for people, but I do have a story. And if you want to follow the story, here it is. All right. Once upon a time, (laughs) there was me uh, writing prose, uh, getting published in these things that used to be called magazines that people used to like buy and read, you know, back in the, back in the, way back in the before times. I've heard of them. Yeah. They were these paper (laughs) things and they tended to take up a lot of space when you let them pile up. And, uh, uh, I had done that for the better part of the eighties okay. and I had amassed a, a, a pretty good, uh, a pretty good retinue of uh, published work. Now what happened was that there was uh, uh, the, the one in a million uh, thing, which is somebody at a studio was a fan of my short stories. Oh, called me up on the phone and said, Hey, would you be interested in coming uh, to talk to us about doing movies? Wow. And that was Mike DeLuca when he was at New Line. And uh, when he was just really uh, barely more than a developmental reader at New Line. And I went to New Line and I met, Mar- I met, uh, I met Mike. And uh, he said, would you be interested in writing our next Freddy movie? Really? Which was Nightmare on Elm Street Part 5, The Dream Child. Okay. And I said sure why not you know having never done this sort of thing before yeah of course you always say yes always say yeah no i wrote i I wrote a treatment for never you know it's 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 like if a door opens up go in and see what's in the room before you say no and uh i wrote up a treatment for him called freddie rules all right and i took it back to him and everybody at new line said this is terrific we want you to write our next freddie movie go across the hall Give them your social security number. Oh, and one more thing. We need to see a screenplay that you've written. (laughs) And I was the only asshole in Los Angeles with no script in his back pocket. (laughs) So I did not get the job. Oh, no. So we, we, we go back to, with our heads hanging down, you know, we go back to Mike's office. What are we going to do now? And uh, they were doing, they were trying to spin t- uh, Freddy off into a TV show at the time called Freddy's Nightmares. I think they did actually do that. I think that they right. were, and they were in fact doing that at the time. And yeah. Mike said, let's go over to the production office of Freddy's Nightmares, which was, if you're in LA, Freddy's Nightmares was way the fuck out in Sun Valley. I can say fuck, can I? I'll bleed it out. Don't worry about it. Every once in a while. Yeah. I'll it was- bleep it out. It's okay. From New Line, uh, uh, the studio where they were shooting Freddy's Nightmares was way the hell out in Sun Valley. Okay. And it was right next to this horrible little bar called The Web, where DeLuca and I shot a lot of pool uh, <laughs> under dicey circumstances. And it was it was like just this, this shithole studio it was tiny, you know. Yeah. And they were doing these shows as cheap as possible. And I began hanging around the office of the producer, Jeff Froehling, uh, trying to figure out how to sell him an episode of Freddy's Nightmares so I could use that as a Thing to show New Line to prove I could write a script. Right. You following this so oh, far? Oh, no, yeah, it's a brilliant idea. Now, if you've ever pitched a script to a production guy on a TV series like that, and back in the day or now, it really hasn't changed that much. You try to figure out every, what are their wants? What are their needs? What will they like? Yep. And you write these detailed things, and they go, well, can you beat it out for us? And Beat It Out has a variety of definitions, all of which apply. 
in this <laughs> circumstance. And you do these complicated documents, and then he, because he, and they go, no, nah, we don't like that. No, nah, we don't like that. And it always boils down to you sitting on the couch in the producer's office. They have these couches that you go in and sit on so that you're automatically lower than they are in the room. <laughs> and frequently, their desk is in front of a window. Interesting. So that you're lower than they are looking up at them, and they're just a silhouette you know, in, yeah. in daylight. It's very imposing and it's very intentional. And I said, you know, Jeff, I'm tired of trying to figure that. What if, what if, um, what if there was like this goth chick and she was in high school and her idea of a dream date is Freddie. Interesting. Didn't, didn't beat it. Didn't write it out. He, he did the thing that happens every so often. He points at me and he goes, go do it. <laughs> and I did it. Uh, it was a screen. It was a teleplay called uh, "Safe Sex" uh, for the first season. Yeah, and uh, and uh, I turned it in, and within 24 hours, I was hired to write New Line's next horror movie, which was Leatherface: Texas Chainsaw Massacre Three. Wow! Now the is thing, that so, the one with McConaughey? No. Okay. That was after us. Okay. All right. Uh. uh this was the one where they wanted to try to twist the chainsaw stuff into a franchise like Freddy. Okay. All so right. there are very clear uh, uh, mirrors of the way things that were done in Freddy movies, such as the ver very beginning of the movie where uh, Leatherface is sewing together his mask out of other people's faces, right. just like the beginning of Nightmare on Elm Street where Freddy is making the glove. Oh, I gotcha. His, in his workshop. So they're using it as a template. Let me ask so, you this. Did they shoot that episode of Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, uh, the TV show? Yes, they did. Not only did the first teleplay I wrote get bought and produced, but the first movie I wrote got bought and produced, one after the other. And Fantastic. I'll never forget the day when both of them happened. It was in January. It was a, it was on the 13th of January. It wasn't a Friday the 13th. That would have been perfect. You know? <laughs> but... I, we subsequently wrote, I subsequently wrote the most censored episode of Freddy's Nightmares, for, censored for sex. Okay. Uh, they cut eight minutes out of the show. Wow. Now, if you've ever watched film and this you was- You went for it. This was still on film. It was shot in uh, 16 mil. Okay. Uh, if you've ever watched eight minutes of film go through a movieola, you know it's an eternity. Mm-hmm. And so we were in the position of what are we going to put in place of this stuff that we cut out? Yeah. We not only wrote the most censored episode of Freddy's Nightmares, we wrote the most censored chainsaw movie ever done at that point because <laughs> we had to go back to the MPAA 11 times. Oh, my gosh. Uh, we missed our release date. Um, they had done all the publicity in November uh, 89, and the movie didn't come out until early 1990. And when it did come out, there was no advertising because all the money had been blown four months oh, earlier. Oh no! Was it a sleeper hit at least? No. Oh of man! The top ten of the top ten movies that came out that week, it was number eleven. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, there's no advertising budget. Nobody knew it was there. So we're, you know, and and the the funny thing and the ironic thing is that it gained ground as a kind of a cult movie. And right. about four years ago. Back before uh, Cine Family in L.A. Uh, dissolved into scandal, they used to have these midnight showings at the old silent movie theater and stuff. And says, "Well, we want to do Leatherface, and we're going to have some of the actors come down, like Billy Butler and Ken Foray. You know, will come down." And we had a midnight showing of Leatherface, and it was a full house. And uh, I realized at that point something that I said to the audience when I was talking to them. I said, "We made the worst." Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie ever made until the next one came out. <laughs> and that was the one with McConaughey. It's a great way to look at it. And th thank heavens for Matthew McConaughey because next to his movie, we just look better and better and better. That's so, great. So in the story of what do you tell an aspiring screenwriter and how you get started, if you want to do it the way that I did it, which was spend a decade writing fiction, and hope somebody at a studio notices you and calls you on the phone because I didn't have any representation, any way in, nor did I have any 
aspiration to do that. What I thought was going to happen was if I wrote enough books, somebody would buy rights and yeah. one of them might get made into a movie that way. And that's right. not how it happened. Well, that's not how it happened at all. But I found one guy in Hollywood that was a fan of the stories. Your path, though, as deliberate as deliberate or even potentially, as you may say, accidental as it was, I actually think it was quite brilliant because I actually know a writer who he would he's he tells people write as many blogs as you can because you never know he wrote a blog he wrote a post on a blog uh about screenwriting and filmmaking that went viral a um a producer found it picked it up uh loved it loved what he had to say hired him to write a script that script now had a theatrical release and is on streaming and netflix and so i'd say that is the the modern day version of exactly what you were doing and it was about putting yourself out there and i think that is brilliant no writing is wasted yeah if you ever write it down and if you if you write a screenplay and nobody likes it it's grist for the mill stuff that you love in that screenplay is going to get recycled if only spiritually through other screenplays. Oh, absolutely. I cannibalize you know? my old stuff if I have to. I think and and, and that brilliant. and that uh, you know because if you don't do a movie of it you may do a comic book of it. Yeah. No, remember, I think that's for, that's a great advice. Remember the period of time where we were dealing with like development people who were so uh it's funny they call them development people. There's cuz they're developmentally arrested but but uh <laughs> Uh, development people who were so developmentally arrested, there was a period of time where nobody was ashamed to say, well, we really can't read your script. Can you do it as a comic book first? Because wow. everybody was buying comics in Hollywood, right? Right. So it's a, can you do it as a comic first? Well, that kind of came true, you know, <laughs> in, in the long run. And, and with the success of comic book movies, you yeah. know, everybody, everybody became, uh, substantially more interested uh, comic books were never a low rent neighborhood in the movie industry well i want to talk about this because you you wrote the crow right yeah. and that was way in early i mean i think the crow batman blade i think your movies uh and those movies helped launch the comic book industry in hollywood the only movie that they ever compared the crow to was batman I think tonally it's it's close. I mean, I've I've read your script, and and I and I'm reading it, and it reads similar to the tone of Batman, but it goes in a way different direction. I wrote that I wrote that script having absolutely no familiarity with Batman. Yeah, I think it just <laughs> I, I think it's just it it's 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 just good writing is what it is, and the way you describe the city of. It, you know, it's in it's engorging the 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 alleyways around it, and you have these like beautiful descriptions of it swallowing swallowing the 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 city itself. I mean, it's it's it, it paints that kind of gothic nature uh, uh, that you expect from like a type of of a metropolis like that. So it really is it really is an other world city because being from Michigan, you know yeah. that this has nothing to do with what Detroit looks like. No, no, but I mean, it, you know, you in the crow, you've got you've got uh, Devil's Night, which was a which was a big problem here. I mean, that I was remember a Detroit thing. Yes. Yeah, I remember as a kid, um, we were very scared of Devil's Night. It was a real thing, uh, and and uh, it finally got under control. But at one point, it was it was it was scared into us. Let's put it that way. Devil's Night was a big problem. Terry Hayes, uh, who. Uh did some writing on the crow uh, uh ancillary writing on the crow wrote a whole script about devil's night that was never uh, never produced and oh. it may it may very well have been that uh, that was one of the things that when terry was going to work on the crow uh that crossed our desk and that may very well have been where the idea to include devil's night was from well that's what i wanted to ask you i mean let's talk about how you got the gig for the crow and specifically what were the adaptations that you had to make for the crow from the graphic novel or comic book series itself well that's that's a complicated path and it's like the way the people ask how did you get the gig to do that movie and the answer the short answer to that one is is that uh after leatherface and i wrote a couple of uh uh critter sequels for new line and I really was doing yeah three and four they're both mine that's awesome 
Uh, we shot them back to back in a supermarket on Pico Boulevard in, 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 in Hollywood. <laughs> there were still props from Suburban Commando, the Hulk Hogan movie in the, in the, in the background. Wow. <laughs> but we had, see in Leatherface, we got Viggo Mortensen before he was Viggo. Oh, really? And Critters 3 was Leonardo DiCaprio's first feature film. <laughs> he was like 12, you know, or something like that. That's fantastic. Uh, we had Angela Bassett in Critters 4. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was... Look at the talent that they have watched, We're the man. star makers. We, yeah. we had Angela Bassett and Brad Dourif, believe, believe it or not. Wow. And and uh, uh, so... I got called to do as Penelope Spiris wanted to do a movie called Deadly Metal. Okay. Which was about a heavy metal band that eats its groupies, you know, basically. <laughs> That's and an so interesting that, concept. All that, right. Le that led to a really interesting meeting uh, that, that didn't evolve into anything. Although Penelope was, you know, Penelope was wonderful. And the guy, the producer who called that meeting wound up uh, changing positions and he was working for a, uh, Ed Pressman at the time. And when Alex decided they wanted another writer on The Crow, Cotty Chubb, who was working at Ed Pressman, remembered me from the Deadly Metal meeting. And he called me and he goes, do you think you'd be interested in this? And I had no familiarity with the comic book. Yeah, I had never seen it before. I didn't know Obar. I surely didn't know him as well as I know him now. Right. And, and uh, we went in and there commenced probably... Uh, about a year and a half of working on that screenplay. Draft wow. after draft after draft after draft in LA. And then finally in Wilmington, North Carolina, three months before production started, we're yeah. all holed up there uh, writing a draft a day, you know, basically. Wow, really trying to figure this script out. Well, because uh, what the way that it wound up was that uh, Alex and I were sharing a house. Proyas and I were sharing a house in Wilmington, he was upstairs and I was downstairs. And in the evenings, uh, during pre-production, um, we would literally sit on opposite sides of the room with our backs to each other, typing away on PowerBook 140s. Wow. At the time. And then he'd hand me what he had and then I'd rewrite it. I'd hand it back and he'd rewrite it. And that's, we were doing that all through uh, production. In fact, when we were shooting um, about because it was virtually all night shoots. And so about right. two o'clock and two o'clock, two o'clock, about two, let me, sorry, it was virtually all night shoots. And so um, about two o'clock in the morning was lunch. And at lunch, I got 10 minutes uh, with Alex, like in his trailer, to find out what I was going to spend the next 24 hours doing. And so did uh, Peter Pound, our storyboard guy. He and I would go in together and we'd sit there with Alex at lunch and we'd find out how wh what our next day was going to be for. This of. is this is during production? Yes. So while they're shooting. Yes. Oh, I see. So Alex didn't have a completed script before he went into shooting. Well, we didn't have a completed comic either, Jeff. Uh, oh, uh, that I did uh, not know that. The comic wasn't finished. Uh, when we when we started writing the script and even up through production, uh, James Abar had only finished 3 issues. Of the comic, we had uh, a we had a set of incomplete pencils. Oh my on gosh! The last I had no idea. two parts, and we literally kind of had to dope out for ourselves how it was going to end, <laughs> because uh, because well, okay, uh, he comes back from the dead, and he shoots a lot of heroin. He plays a guitar, kills some guys, shoots some more heroin, plays a guitar, kills some more guys, and he kills some guys, and then he shoots some heroin. <laughs> That's your, beat, that's your beat. That's your beat sheet. Yeah, yeah, basically. And it, how long has it been since he killed some guys? Okay, let's let's <laughs> let's go back. So, your primary things are, you know, renew, reduce the number of bad guys because in the comic, what like seven people come out of that car? You know, I for, you know I forget. Okay, all right. It's a lot of people come out of the car, and it says we gotta reduce the number of bad guys and focus on how we're going to eliminate them. And in, in the course of that, try to do something that's something other than death wish of the living dead. Right. Right. And that's where Brandon comes in because Brandon contributed to the script. Really? Alex contributed to the script. Brandon said, we originally had an Asian bad guy and Brandon said, no way. Yeah. That and makes we, sense. And we said, you're right. You're right. 
because we were just kind of following the you know the magnetism of what you know like like mystic weirdness was be right the, right the Bai Ling character yeah and, and it's like there's an echo of that in Bai Ling yeah but now she we've we've recast her so it's actually kind of funny you know it's like well well when uh when Wincott says oh she's my sister yeah you know, <laughs> like, what the hell going, going what? on yeah, yeah. it yeah. works though and and um one thing speaking of Brandon I thought you because know, I rewatched it recently I mean I loved that film as a kid I I, I can admit that I definitely dressed up as the crow for Halloween. Not gonna lie. So did my nephew. Yeah. So so watching that watching it again uh recently, it holds up. It holds up, David. That is a solid, solid story. The script is good. Um, the effects hold up and it's not dated, but Brandon brought levity to the role, which I didn't realize as a kid. But there's a couple of scenes where the cops is like freeze, don't move, and he shuffles away, kind of like he a goes, uh, vaudevillian. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah, I that's all like, him. Yeah, that's, brilliant. That's all him in, in the moment because the script doesn't say bounce away like a puppet. You know, yeah. it's like oh, that's Brandon. Yeah, yeah, he brought he brought some some extra cool depth to the role. Um, so, so I did not realize that you didn't have a completed story to work off during the, during the shooting. That's absolutely impressive that you're able well, to no, weave everything together. The charter with a lot of adaptations uh, and, and not just comic books, but you know, novels and everything is usually uh, you would like to capture the spirit of the original material, yeah, not absolutely. necessarily transpose it beat for beat right. i mean we had people that were pissed off at the movie because we didn't replicate one panel from the comic i mean literally well, you know, my favorite panel and you didn't do it so your whole movie sucks yeah well there's movies that do that and the movie's terrible yeah so you know i mean whatever you can't you can't please everybody there's a line uh there's a fine line when it comes to fan service yeah you know and it and it's like you got to remember it's like if we don't make anything any good, it's not going to last and nobody's going to want to watch it. Right. Well, I'll, t I'll, I'll tell you, this holds up. Now, is, I'm glad to hear you say that. It does, man. So so there is this, um, I mean, when I was younger, everybody talked about, about the Skull Cowboy and nobody knew what the Skull Cowboy was. Now on the internet, you could find the deleted scene and all of that mm -hmm. stuff. So I personally think that the way this the script is now and the way the mythology is set up, where there isn't it's not overly explained he his soul comes back through the crow he avenges the deaths and then his magic comes from the crow and all that stuff i think that all works the whole skull cowboy thing and coming on and trying to kind of explain everything to him it was in the it was in the script i read the script i want to know what you think do you wish the skull cowboy was there are you glad the way it worked out having it cut not necessarily because uh you know i'm 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 uh, i'm i'm sad that uh michael berryman didn't get more of a part in the movie okay because they it's like you cast michael berryman as the skull cowboy and then you cover his entire head up with makeup you know it's like <laughs> what is the point and his voice that? would have been altered too right yeah, so then exactly. yeah so it's yeah because he had so much gear on his head that when i turn the lines and talk like this <laughs> <laughs> I know because I rehearsed him and 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 uh uh overall though the only reason that that's there is it's it's an image from the comic. Okay. And we thought do we want to get into the idea that if he deviates from redressing the wrongs that were done to him and his loved right. ones. Right. Setting the wrong things right. Uh, we wanted a guy who had gone down the same path like a century earlier. Right. Except he had made the wrong choice, and now he's doomed to be this spectral thing. And it also explained where the crow came from. The right. Bird. Yeah. The, the bird was a familiar of the Skull Cowboy. But you get to the movie, and you don't need any of that. We had shot half of it, and we realized we didn't need it. Yeah. So Alex said, I think we're not going to do it. I think it's out. I think it's, I think and it's a good idea. It's, I, it's, I think it's, it works it's perfectly valid. There's so many films where there is a mystery or there's this monster, this alien, and they overly explain it. And then you kind of lose the audience. I think there is power in the mysticism. I think yeah. there is power in just letting the audience kind of accept it and figure out for themselves what it is. 
Um, Because I think that even adds a little bit of more mystery around that character. And I think it's brilliant. So I, I, I think it worked, but I could totally understand like why you would want that cowboy in there. So no, you've got, you've got to, it's like writing a script in the first place. You've got to write it bad in order to write it good. Okay. And it's like, that's a path that we experimented with that made it all the way to us shooting footage. Right. There were tons of other things in the script that never even made it that far. We, it's out, it's out, it's right. changed, you know, but that's how the evolution, that's how the evolution of a script or at least a good script, I hope. Um, yeah comes about and it's like it's trial and error because you know what you know what a tightrope walk it is just to be making a movie in the first oh place. my god especially if you're working on i don't want to say this the wrong way but like a godlike character that can't die i, I when mm-hmm. i look at one of the wolverine films where wolverine was like super powered and and he couldn't die and so it was like the worst wolverine movie because it wasn't working. The audience wasn't buying it. And then when they depowered him and like Logan and the other films, now people were worried about him because he could die. And so as I'm well, watching, go ahead. There's, there's no risk. There's no there's, risk. Yeah. Then like the stakes Superman, are low. Superman's not interesting unless you have kryptonite. Yeah. Because yeah. he just wins all the time. Exactly. Yeah. And and, and so what I, I thought was great with the crow is because you have this character, you have, you know, you, you have Eric and he can't die. And so you're going, okay, what's going to happen? So you've got the little girl, you know, she's the stakes, right? But then you, you bring in the fact that if you hurt the crow, then that's his power source. And I thought, okay, that is great. So obviously the, the comic books weren't done yet. So was this a you invention? Uh, did this come out of the blue or did you guys kind of just I would say, um, I think, now I'm starting to sound like Alex in an interview now. It's, I think we invented this for the movie. Okay. Uh, the minute I say that, someone will go back to the comic and say, no, no, here's the thing where if you hurt the bird, you hurt him. Yeah. I'm not 100% certain on okay. that one. But, it's, but you can tell that we were testing it out in the movie because it is not explained as clearly as it could be. Yeah. It sort of comes and goes. And uh, I think that's the that's the that's the mark of us coming up with an irresolute idea. But there was enough enough strength to it uh, to persist into the the movie. Also, the fact that unless if he deviates from his agenda, the powers go away like that. Right. And it's like that's the other thing that we were really interested in because and 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 he discovers because first of all he didn't ask to come back. No. And yeah. that's the part that that's one part that really intrigued me. It's like he's back sort of against his will, but now that he's here, you know, which is another reason I think that it's more poignant if it's personalized to just that movie and to just Brandon. I don't think you do sequels. I don't think you do remakes as as well intentioned as they may have been. I just don't I, I don't think it's what Alex says. It's like, just don't mess with this one. You know. I th- yeah yeah do not reboot this and 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 the the sequels never hit what you guys are trying to go for and the magic isn't that he brought to the role isn't that proof that you know going back to that well is not going to work you know how much proof do they need you know apparently they never have enough because they keep talking about redoing it again do they really oh yeah there's been tons of scripts written it's unnecessary it really does hold up um i'll tell you so you got me thinking about it one of my one of the most powerful scenes ah. <laughs> how dare you sir one of the most powerful scenes for for me in that movie was when the the eric busts through the through the window and grabs the mother who's a morphine addict right and he and he and that's the that's the mother of sarah the little girl right and he holds her up to a mirror and he says he says something to her about poison and then the morphine drains from her veins right morphine and, is bad for you Oh my gosh, that was such a powerful scene that it stuck with me as a kid because I'd never seen anything like that before. It was exceptionally powerful. So were you guys intending on making a commentary on drugs or anything like that? Because I mean, obviously, back when this came out, drugs were, I mean, heroin was a big problem. Yeah, well, morphine was a big problem. Uh, and it's And again, it derives from the comic because uh, uh it's a you know a similar so that's not, so that's that, from the comic yeah it, it's the sentiment is from the comic because uh uh obar came up with a line that i always had a problem with because it's not grammatical 
and, it, and, it, and it's like mother is the name for God on the lips and heart, you know, it, of all children. Basically. Yeah, I didn't understand that either. It's like, it's like, it's, it, it, he can say whatever he wants. It's his character. It's just the grammar is screwed up. <laughs> yeah. You know, for me. And so I have a problem, but that's, but that's that statement. Mother is the name for God. Yeah. Uh, that statement is the heart of that scene. Okay. And everything else was just the way we wrote it and, 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 and blocking and everything. And it's like, right. no, it's like it, it upset people when we shot it. Really? Yeah. It's powerful. And, and visually showing that and then the actress, the actor taking that and, and, and really working with it and, and seeing that way on her face as she's running out is beautiful. It's just a powerful scene. And I mean, there's just like a lot of that stuff. You don't expect that from a superhero film, right? You're not going to see that in yeah. Batman. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so, and so, you're the, gonna, or or you're going to expect a moment of levity to like to like defang whatever right. dramatic thing that you've just seen. It's a poke in the ribs, right? You know, when you're watching it, yeah. No, you weigh on it. You, you like it's 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 heavy. It sits there for a minute. It's okay. It we works. Don't have, we don't have wacky villains, villains in weird costumes. We have absolute scumbags. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and they, they are in weird costumes in their own way. Oh yeah. And we do have comic relief because we have skank. Yeah, so it's, you do. It's, it's you know it, it all sort of fell to him but it's not tongue-in-cheek um and and i think brandon brought that as well so uh, since if you play it straight play it straight it'll take care of itself trust me yeah don't go overly ham and don't get pretentious i think is definitely something you want to be careful don't, of. Don't, don't shatner it up yeah <laughs> could you imagine so uh so talking about the elephant in the room um a tragic loss with brandon and uh having having to deal with that um and you, since you're actively working on the script at the time how much work needed to be done i because I, I i mean i'm assuming you had you you wanted to complete this project to honor him well that was an issue uh to begin with too because alex just wanted to bury the whole movie really and uh, if, if it had not been for a couple of the actors going and making a, an appeal to Alex directly, which boils down to, listen, we can either bury Brandon and the movie, or we can bury Brandon and have the movie stand as a legacy to him. Yeah, and it does. Alex changed his mind. It took, it took, uh, uh, it took six weeks. I lived through the same six weeks that everybody else did. I was there when we shut the production down. Wow. And everybody had to get on planes and go home. Yeah. And we're sitting around. Now, now picture this. We're sitting around for six weeks. We're sitting around for a month and a half waiting for the phone to ring. And it, had, finally, it, had to, it had to be hard. I mean, it had to be. It's so tragic. Going home was hard. Staying yeah. there was hard. Going back was ultra hard. Yeah. But um, three quarters of the crew came back. Some of them worked for reduced fees. Some of them worked for no money. Okay. Uh, uh, there was one thing that happened, incidentally, as a result of this tragedy, which is absolutely the worst thing that can happen to you on a movie set. Okay. Okay. I dare you to come up with something worse. You know, it, well, it's worse if it has a bigger body count, I, I guess. Yeah, but, I'm, yeah, I'm at a loss. Yeah. It, it's like, imagine, put yourself in the position you're being there and watching, you know, watching somebody die right in front of you and going, well, okay. Next scene, you know. Oh my goodness! And to have and to have uh, to have Brandon die, and uh, we were four days away from finishing production. Oh, unfortunately, those four days were all character scenes with his wife. Okay. In the movie, and we had to find ways to cover that. I'll give you a perfect example. And we had we had to spend a lot of time thinking about it and knocking our heads against the wall a long time. There's a scene where Sarah, and she's called Sarah incidentally, because the little girl in the comic is named Ellie. Okay. But the Sophia Sheenas character is named Shelly. And we thought Shelly and Ellie, that's just too cute. Yeah, we have to change it. You know, we yeah. have so that's why she's that's why she's named Sarah. Okay. There's a scene where Sarah goes back to the apartment a year afterwards is when she finds the cat. Okay. Gabriel, the cat. And he's not there. He was there once and now he's gone. And she's talking to the empty room. And he shows up at the end of that scene. You know, 
because he is a spectral supernatural presence. Right. Well, that scene originally had Brandon in it. Okay. He was there talking to her when she goes back to the apartment. She said, and then it was an example of a scene where we said somehow it fits and somehow it's more powerful if he's not there and she's talking to the empty room. How many people have ever done that with a loved one who's died? Yeah. You no. Know? Yeah. And then to have him appear at the end, that's when Jeff Cadiente was standing in for him. And, uh, we just had to figure out ways to to fake it, man. You know, right? The, it's so funny to listen to fans of the film talk about, oh, they're positive that they know which scenes Brandon's in and and not. Being a person myself who was standing there for most of the scenes, that is, in every shot in this movie, I can probably tell you where I'm standing relative to the camera. <laughs> in each scene, it's like I was there. Oh yeah, oh, that's not Brandon. That's the stuff. Nope, that's Brandon. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Because not every shot of Brandon is a mug shot where he turns his face to the camera, so you know it's him. Exactly. You know, a yeah. perfect example of that is when he does the high dive through the billboard. Right. Well, Brandon's not going to jump off a building. That's Jeff Cadiente doing the dive, but the impact is Brandon. Oh, okay. So he gets up out of the thing. He jumps into the car with uh, with Ernie yeah, Hudson with that's a crazy Brandon. laugh. Yeah. Okay. That's Brandon. Okay, very good. Because we had just, when we're shooting this movie, Jeff, uh, uh, is it Jeff or Jeffrey? What should Je I say? Jeffrey's fine. Jeffrey's fine. When we were shooting this movie, Jeffrey, <laughs> uh, we're also going to the movies in North Carolina. We're going to see this movie that just came out while we're shooting The Crow. This movie is called Jurassic Park. Oh, and yeah. we're sitting in the theater and we're going, oh my God, everything is about to change horribly. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, and, that, that changed and, everything. And like you were talking about other aspects of this that that differentiated, I think one of the one of the the pure things about the crow as a movie is that we were right on the edge of CGI. Yeah. A little bit later, and the movie would have been overrun with CGI. Yeah, you but have a lot it of is, so only, practical we only, effects. We only, we only, we only supered uh, Brandon's face into three scenes. I think you're one of the first films to do it too. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm pretty I, sure I, it was. I well, it was, it was, record. it was, well, it was you guys, and it was Jurassic Park were the first. Yeah. You had to have been to there. When we we're all watching Jurassic Park, and we're just like in the theater, and we're like looking at each other like this. It's like, uh oh. <laughs> ah, I, I remember watching avatar going dinosaurs are real you know what i mean i've yeah. said that but then i only experienced that twice I experienced that on on then on, on Jurassic park and then experienced it when uh, avatar came out and you said i sat down avatar and went okay all right things are changing again this thing is a whole new level um but when we started when we started shooting the movie it was uh i was shooting video on the set the whole time okay and uh uh it was freezing in Wilmington, we were there. It was the the temperature was so our wet downs on the phone pole wires froze. It looked cold. You could those see seat, breath from the actors. Where he's yeah, getting his boots out of the dumpster in the rain. It was yeah. like it was like twenty degrees, maybe. Oh my gosh! You know, and we would run up and like throw these heated blankets on him and throw him in the back of this. And he's got no. Let's do it again. Let's do it. He's barefoot. He doesn't have a shirt on. And he's got fake rain coming down to plus it's freezing out. So everybody who's shooting him has got parkas and shit on, you know? Yeah. And, and then uh, we, we uh, stopped production. And then when we went back, it was a typical North Carolina humid spring. And it was just like, Oh God, this, it wow. was so opposite what we had left. So it was like the, you know, the, the East and the East and West of the crow. Yeah. That's crazy. Uh, one thing you did in The Crow, you used a lot of rain. And you used, uh, the, he, his character sings a song about rain. Um, he comments on rain. The little girl comments on rain. So, I mean, water traditionally is used um, visually as emotional, uh, emotional changes within a character. Um, you can use water as sadness, but you can use it as change. And I was wondering, I mean, was this a, was this a, a decision that you made purposely? Well, we wanted to shoot at night, and I think most of the wet downs and the rain come from a desire to make it a very kind of what we call a gothic noir. 
okay kind of, kind of look yeah um if it has reflections in character balances that's a good thing but i can't think of a moment where we sat down and intentionally said what you just said okay it was like if you decide to do things a certain way there are ingredients that go with it and they improve what you're after uh, uh visually and storytelling wise and i think it just made it it, it made a lot of sense and it, and it got us with one of one of our lines where you know where, where we say it can't rain all the time can't rain all the time exactly you have no idea people have had this tattooed on their bodies i've got a file full of photographs of people's tattoos of this wow. of their crow tattoos obar has just got tons of the flaming outline the bird of brandon's face uh, uh uh every all these icons from the movies and when you go to uh where brandon is buried next to his dad in seattle the grave site and the, the two tombstones are side by side and there's a bench where you can sit and watch it and you go and there's always offerings at the grave the little bottles of whiskey and there's flowers and there's cards and there's poem and you pick up some of the cards and you read them and in the card is a line of dialogue that you wrote. Wow. You know, that is a punch in the heart. Yeah, that's, that's, oh my goodness. That's got to be, that's got to be overwhelming. And this is, this is something that you wrote. It's not from the, it's not from the comic. Well, I'm speaking of, uh, it, it's like there, there are quotes from the comic, quotes from the movie and quotes that I wrote. And it can't rain, it can't rain all the time is one of mine. That's awesome. And, and it's a uh, great line, but it, it overall forget me you know yeah overall it just demonstrates that this thing has a permanence that a lot of movies don't have i think i agree with you it's a it's it's a cult classic and i almost think that that undersells it because it has influenced uh so many other films it has influenced so many other styles i think calling it a gothic noir is absolutely perfect um it is its own thing in so much that other uh other projects have tried to replicate it and i mean lots that's, of other projects have tried to replicate yeah. it in multiple languages yeah multiple exactly countries. um and uh yeah so it really does hold up and i was i was watching it again and i was really appreciating it and i'm so glad uh that i did you know because watching it when i was younger i, I couldn't even have the appreciation of looking at gold there's rain everywhere and he's got this line of this dialogue and it's right it's all tied in together so beautifully and I know that was it was either intuitive, it was skill, it was mastery, whatever you want to call it, but it really does work within the story. Now, I'm not, at the same time, I'm not making a claim that we were strategically brilliant all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Because you know the kind of the seat of your pants nature of making, uh, making movies uh, cancels that out. It's like what I am saying is that there are, there are, there are story elements there are characters yeah. actors, and things that come along in movies that come along at the right time yep and i think this was one of those things and but being able to capitalize that and take advantage of it even as you have done in your own career i'll say this and then you could get uncomfortable by it it's brilliant and that's what it is um and, well, and i certainly i certainly uh after the crow i gotta tell you uh, uh, it's like uh, I had meetings on every goddamn comic book movie imaginable after the crow. <laughs> I believe it. And you can see how many of them I've written to this day. Well, you, you're still working. You're writing um, You're writing books. You're writing comics. You're writing novels. What are you working on right now? Storm I'm King writing little, I'm writing a little bit of everything. I, I'm... Uh, um, uh, I, I feel guilty almost because people, you know, people have been impacted by... Uh, COVID-19 in uh, 2020 and uh, they said, well, well, how do you feel about lockdown? You know, how do you feel about the, it's like, don't call it the pandemic, call it what it is. It's the plague. You know, <laughs> it's, it is. And they say, well, how do you, how do you feel about that? And I says, well, you know, my, my term for this period may upset a few people because I like to call it uh, writer's paradise. Oh yeah, I don't have any problem with it. I mean, it sucks yeah. that that if you have you know something I mean. in development, yeah. You if you know have what I mean, though, right? Yeah, yeah, if you have something in development and it gets put on pause, that sucks. And I mean, I'm experiencing that. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure you're experiencing. It. There's so many of us that are experiencing that. Um, um, but as far as being productive, I haven't had a day off. 
I, I have, uh, it's, I, I'm involved in this really intensive, deep project of bringing my backlist. You see, I've written about 30 books Wow! in my life. And I want to bring my back, I, and I started last May, uh, bringing my backlist into print in uniform editions. So the spines all match on the shelf, right? Oh, that's cool. Uh, that we're doing uh, with my pal, John Scolari, who runs uh, Cimarron Street Books. Uh, because I needed a middleman uh, uh, to do this. I mean, if you're going to use Amazon as your publisher, you know, you need to make sure that your product looks like an actual book and not and not something that somebody whacked together in their garage. Um, and we have been uh, reissuing uh, my backlist in what I like to call remixed editions. That is, they have more stuff, cool, more visuals. It's a version that never existed of this book before. We would like to get a perfect version of each one. And we put out a book a month since last June. Oh, wow. That's very prolific. And so, uh, and we're not going to run out anytime soon. It's like, we got the next three lined up. What surprised me was the number of artists that I've worked with before who volunteered to do stuff, which was terrific. Yeah, that's fantastic. So if you look around on Amazon, the whole, the whole uh, objective was to get a foothold on Amazon's algorithm. Makes sense. Because if you have one book and you're publishing, you know, my, my sixth novel in the, in the endless saga of vampire government, you know, or something like that, yeah, uh, nobody's going to see it. But if your books connect to the other books in the algorithm, we've got six so far and they're already starting to reference each other. That's cool. And so, and this can, this has the potential to make money for the creators of the books on a level that, uh, professional publishing royalties from New York never equal. Well, what's the name of the series? What do you mean? Is it a full series or is there individual oh, it's a books? Series, it's a series of my books. It doesn't have an overall okay. umbrella. Do you umbrella have a website item. of the books that I can link well, you, to for you people? Can, you can look at them on the Cimarron Street reps, website. As oh, they perfect. Come out. We will and do that. They pop, up, they pop up on Amazon, but you can also order them direct from Cimarron Street. And Cimarron Street is, a, is an I Am Legend reference, by the way. Uh, thanks to thanks to uh, thanks to John being obsessed with that movie, but um, because the individual titles uh, we're doing we're favoring short story collections of mine. But back in the '90s, I wrote a column for Fangoria magazine, okay, called "Raving and Drooling," and we put those into a book in 2000, which won an award. It was nice; somebody gave us a trophy for it. Cool. And nobody reprinted it since then. So that was our lead title: was the reprint of uh the book version of raving and drooling which was called wild hairs oh yeah i've heard of it then, since then we've been concentrating on uh the short story collections because those are the most fragile books there are now it seems like it shouldn't be that way because if you want to tell scary stories on television or in print or in movies uh, the best way to tell scary stories is to keep them short. Okay. And I would rather watch a movie made out of a short story than a movie made out of a novel where you have to start chopping its arms and legs. I think off it's a great, that, I think it's a great point. I mean, you're talking about any Stephen King adapted movie right now. You, you look at one of Steve's books and you go, okay, we got to figure out what we're going to start, what we're going to cut first. Whereas exactly. if you take the story you may not love graveyard shift, you know, as a movie, but it's like, you know, the people sat down just like anybody sits down to make a movie. They sat down and said, okay, how can we make 90 minutes out of this? Yeah, exactly. You know, it's a one shot because horror stories are all about what, what Edgar Allan Poe used to talk about as the effect and everything, and everything builds toward the effect. It's true. Then it's true now. And that's why I think anthology horror shows are still the best versions of that okay like you know, american horror yeah we're now seeing well, american horror story has it both ways which i really like it's like we're anthological in that we keep using the same cast for different stories which i think personally is brilliant yeah it's a good idea uh, uh and 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 uh people have their quibbles with it but i'm a huge fan of that show yeah what's the other show i'm a huge fan of what else black mirror yep okay you know anthology show right yeah the best the closest thing that we could possibly hope for to a modern version of the twilight zone yeah that's true 
That's I've I've heard it called that, but I used to love the outer limits as a kid. Well, I'm the world expert on the outer limits, so stop there. Okay. That's a whole different show. I'll bring it. I'll bring it back. I've only done two books on the whole show. Yeah, it's like. (laughs) All right. So, uh, what are you doing? Well, well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. We continue. You can ask me, or I can just go on rambling. What are you doing with Storm King? Storm King, John Carpenter, John and Sandy Carpenter's uh, publishing enterprise. Like I said, uh, when Leatherface came out, Mm -hmm. they wanted me to do the comic book based on Leatherface, and I said okay, okay, because I, I thought I could do it. And I was a miserable failure at writing comic book scripts. It has to be a different process. It is a whole, if you, screenplays won't even begin to do it for you. If you go into the way comic scripts used to be written and everybody who's a comic creator, you know, Askel Barr uh, uh, has a different way of doing it. I mean, if you're the creator of your own comic, you know, it boils down to whatever you wrote on the legal pad. Okay. And so, Fortunately, a friend of mine, I mean, I got my name on the cover of the Leatherface comic book, but fortunately, a friend of mine who was used to comics named uh, uh, Mort Castle, he took over Leatherface. And so I had tentatively something to do with the first issue, and then it's all more, and then there's my name on the cover of it, and I didn't have anything to do with it, except I wrote the source material. Okay. Well. Right? So it comes up that, hey, maybe you should write for Storm King. So it's got Dwayne over here. I don't know if you know who Dwayne Straczynski is, but he's a good friend of mine. He's a hard-boiled writer and is an extremely tar- tall man. Yeah. And Jim Bradstreet, who is notorious in the comic book industry for his wonderful you know, covers for The Punisher and Hellblazer and all this stuff, much in demand. They had already hooked up with Sandy for the first issue in 2015 of what was called John Carpenter's Tales for a Halloween Night. Okay which turns out to be an annual anthology that we do. And I've been in every issue since the first issue. Cool. And uh, they said, you should write a comic for Sandy. And I needed an excuse to reconnect with Sandy, who was an old friend. We had this terrific meeting and she goes, well, what story would you tell? And here I am on the couch again, spinning a story, right? You know, just like in the production (laughs) office of the guy. And she goes, do it. And Dwayne was visiting from uh, Philadelphia at that time. He was staying in my guest room in Hollywood. And, uh, and, uh, I said, I'll show this, I'll show you what I think this should be. And you tell me if I shot myself in the foot or not. And one thing that I did, uh, was I really, uh, I decided very quickly to write the comic script in final draft. Okay. And so the only thing I'm doing is I'm telling you what panels there are. And the thing that broke it for me was that I'm going, you're directing this. You're deciding what everybody sees, and the panel is a static shot. Oh, okay. And they can be different sizes, different. And I collaborate with my artists a lot. Uh, when we do a project, it's it's like so we we yeah I hear going bam bam bam. I'm in Tales for Halloween Night every year. Cool. Sandy goes. Well, we want you to do a series for us now. What what do you got? Again, I'm on the couch. Another one liner. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, and so we did a five issue series called The Standoff about a UFO full of nasty aliens that crashes into a maximum security prison. Oh, that'd be cool. It was. Yeah. And you can get the graphic novel at the, at the Storm King website. And so we wanted to keep, we got uh, this really wonderful artist named Andres Esparza. He lives in Monterey. And, uh, and, a, and a colorist named Sergio Martinez. Uh, Janice Chang's our letterer. You know, she's worked in every comic book on the face of the earth. And yeah. Bradstreet does the covers. And so uh, Sandy goes, all right, well, we finished the standoff. What do you got next? And I said, well, this is a little more sprawling. So I don't know. So I just, it took us a long time. It took me a long, it took me 18 months to write, basically. Oh, wow. Uh, because uh, I would take a break whenever the artists fell behind. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And so we're doing an eight issue series. And she goes, the title is too long. The title is too long. Get a shorten it. Get a shorten it. Get a shorten it. All right. How about this? Because all the titles are John Carpenter's something or other. Right. Yeah, right? of course. BM so this Graham. one is John Carpenter's Hell. And cool. I just turned in the last issue of it about two weeks ago. Very good. 275 pages of comic script. Oh, my God. For eight, for eight issues. Okay. It's going to drop in a, it's going to drop in end of March, beginning of April. 
I think. But again, that's the thing that you can go to Storm King. Yeah, we will we will put this check out. We'll put that in the in the uh, link in the info for this episode, as well as oh. Cin- Cinnabar- Cinnamon Street. Uh, Cimarron. Cimarron Street. We'll put Cin- Cimarron. We'll put it's Cin- like Cimarron. It's Cinnabon? Like Cimarron Strip. Cinnabon? It's, it's, not Cinnabon. <laughs> it's like Cimarron Strip, you know, the Western, yeah. but like it's a street. Yeah, it's, we'll put that in the link as well. C-I-M-A-R-R-O-N, Cimarron Street. All right, very good. And so at the same time, last year in the before times, you know, before March 2020, uh, we had just debuted Creep Show on Shutter. Oh, cool. And uh, 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 the first uh, story that I did for Creep Show turned out to be one of the most popular shows that was in October of. Uh, so you wrote an episode, or you oh, wrote? Yeah. Oh, that's great! Oh, more than I one. didn't. I didn't realize uh, they had that going again. No, it, it debuted uh, October 2019 on Shutter. It was on Shutter, which is why a lot of people didn't see it. But it was based on a story I had also adapted for Sandy's comic book. Very good Very story cool. of mine. Yeah, and so we came back, and uh, th- uh, I had gone to Atlanta. I watched the filming. You know, we're we're hanging out, and it's like we're getting ready. And it was a no brainer they're going to do a season two. And uh, I said, "What are we going to do for season two? And then the shutdown happened. Yeah, right when they were supposed to start shooting it, and so that was delayed until about uh, last uh, September. They finally started having COVID protocols, and people started flying back to Atlanta, okay, uh, uh, to to shoot it. And uh, they decided to do season two and three back to back, and they should be finished shooting season three in about two weeks. Dude, that's awesome uh, in Atlanta. But I've got I've got uh, a couple of shows I worked on in season two, which I have no idea when they're gonna uh, uh, broadcast. 